Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. And welcome to this week's edition of Market Pulse Podcast, Pros and Pioneers. I'm very privileged this week to be joined by uh, Jason Hunt. Jason has been immersed in digital marketing since way back in 2007. That's that's some tenure now. Doesn't feel that long. I want to say that's a short time away, but it is actually quite a long time. And my hair went with it as well, unfortunately. (laughs) Same with my color. Jason is co-founder at Merge Media who are Canada's premier digital marketing agency with services in social media marketing, Google advertising and SEO. But most, most interestingly for me, especially is that Jason runs the Merged Marketing Podcast and he himself has been a featured speaker and host at lots of conferences worldwide from Ad World to the Affiliate Summit and also has um, a, a book that was released in 2022, which is Drop the Mic Marketing, How to Find Your Social Media Voice. Again, all things that I'm super passionate about. If we were, we were destined to meet Jason. Um, just before we dive into a little bit more about you, and I'll I'll let you share a bit of your story. Just before we dive into that, I just want to uh, give a shout out to our sponsors, Gridbank.io. Um, if you're listening to this, you know I'm all about building content at scale. Sometimes you just need basis video reels to get content out there. The problem with a lot of footage banks is they just don't look native to social, especially portrait format. And that actually hinders content performance. So gridbank.io is a database of what we call authentic video clips. Great for pumping out concepts, A-B test thumbnails, and creating authentic looking edits. If you're looking to get ahead on socials without burning out your team, you can get 10% off your annual subscription with code Paul. And I promise you won't regret it. It is really cool. So thank you for your patience there while we did the sponsor show there, Jason. And before we kick off into your bio in a little bit more detail, you've got a very fascinating fun fact. So do you want to share with the audience about your journey in Japan? Yeah, definitely. As you alluded to earlier on there, my, my, my history in digital marketing dates back to 2007, where I was using the likes of MySpace at the time and SoundClick to promote my Japanese rock band. I was living in Japan, planned on staying for one year to teach English. One year turned into four pretty quickly because I met some students and some friends and decided to start a a rock band. And that we were an okay rock band. We were pretty good. I was a terrible singer, but through the likes of MySpace at the time, I was able to promote our band to a point where we were able to manufacture a tour of Japan and came out with a couple albums. And I give full credit to my ability to market more so than my ability to sing. And that really through that whole experience was really an epiphany for me to, and I came to the realization that I enjoyed marketing more than performing and making the music. So that's when I transitioned out of that space into uh, focusing on marketing as a career. So it's interesting then you came to, I I guess it's similar sort of perspectives, how I ended up uh, accidentally involved in marketing as a lot of people are, um, where there's a desperate need to achieve something and the book stops with you. So you've got to learn how to do it by the seat of your pants. Um, so do you want to give us a little bit more detail on, on how that journey got started for you? Yeah. So when I, uh, it was 2012, when I actually worked with a traffic company, buying and selling online traffic, essentially using that space on the side of articles as essentially real estate and selling it to advertisers and in the dating niche, in the gambling niche, and all these type of niches that wanted to buy traffic on websites. That's how I got my feet wet into the digital side. And then in 2016, I started a social media agency called Fresh Crowd. And with that agency, we we're basically working with local businesses. I would be knocking on doors and having conversations with business owners about doing their social media for way too cheap, 199 bucks a month to do daily posting in 2016 way undervaluing myself and the business. But through that, I was able to manufacture 100 clients within a year and then hiring a team underneath me to start managing the content and allowing me to help grow the business and move it forward. And then in 2019, I I realized there was a void in the social media agency business I had, and that was 
having having a Google agency so I can sell Google services and search engine optimization. So I merged my company with a locally leading SEO company to form Merged Media. And the two of our agencies just started cross-selling our clients and we grew into a full service agency, which is called Merged Media today out of Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Fantastic. That's really, as, as somebody who's still fairly young in their marketing journey, and I still, uh, I'm still adamant that I'm not a marketer. Or I've got one foot in both sales and marketing doors, as I believe most marketers should, but I probably classify myself more as RevOps as opposed to marketing. It's interesting. But to hear you say $199 per month is cheap for social media posts, I'd imagine that there's a lot of our audience out there who are small business owners who are now sat with their head in their hands crying into the cornflakes because they were hoping to get some of that $199 a month. It isn't, it's not cheap, is it? No, and keep in mind, not just, it's funny, like, not just, it's super cheap, $199 a month, but the fact that it was a human going in there and creating the copy, creating the graphics, doing the graphic design work, uploading the photos, everything was done by a human. Where nowadays, the cost for social media management is typically at least 5x that. And now you have AI to help you get the job done quicker and the productivity has increased tenfold. So it's just, it's just funny how times have changed and now there's just a higher price tag on it, but yet you can get the job done much quicker. Mind you, this is, was a business at the time, just starting out being very entrepreneurial, doing a lot of experimenting. And naturally over time, you build up case studies and more legitimacy to the business. And obviously there's, there's ROI to be had even at the price point that it is now. So back in two, 2016, yes, businesses were getting a steal, but I was also experimenting on their dime. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that the, probably the moral of the story for if you are a small business owner watching this and you are thinking, geez, that I wouldn't, I'd be struggling to afford that now. And I'm looking around for somebody who can do that for us for that sort of price. Now it's like you're wasting your time. If that's what you think the prices are, it's a common, it's a common challenge that I know, and I'd be interested to get your opinion on this, Jason, but like, it's a common challenge. I speak to a lot of people who are in that startup phase that kind of unrealistically expect marketing to be a lot less expensive than it is. Um, I think there's some false expectations in there. I think there's a, it's a little bit, it seems fairly simple from the outside until you start to see all of the tasks and roles and things that need doing that come under that. Is that your experience as well? Is that something? <laughs> Yeah. So I always say as a benchmark, 7% of your annual revenue should be dedicated to marketing. That doesn't need, doesn't mean it all needs to go to your digital marketing agency. You could be doing print ads, going to conferences, all that type of stuff, but 7%. So seven, if you're a million dollar company, $70,000 should be dedicated specifically to marketing. We do it ourselves and we recommend anybody else do it as well. So if you tell me you're hundred thousand dollar a year business, the math is easy. Right. So for us, when I hear I have a budget of $70,000 in a year or 7% of a million dollars to spend on marketing, I can go to the table and be like, okay, based on that, I recommend doing this and this. And if you have a lower annual revenue, then obviously we make sacrifices where we think sacrifices need to be made. Yeah. I think the other thing to consider if you're a small business as well is that kind of services exchange that you can get into with other small businesses. If you meet a marketing business that maybe needs the services that you provide, it's always worth asking the question, could you do us some marketing support um, for free? And in return, we'll give you the same sort of value back without exchanging money between the two businesses to save on the tax. And, and everybody comes out of that looking a bit more professional, right? Oh, 100%. Obviously, there's, there's deals to be had, partnerships. Like for us, we have equity partnerships with some of the businesses we work with. We own a percentage of a landscape company. And through that, we focus on the marketing aspects. We're incentivized by the growth of the business and, and dividend payouts. And uh, through that, the marketing's taken care of. It's not an, addition, an additional expense to pay for the management of that marketing. We work with certain SaaS companies as well, where we have the same type of arrangement. So it's, there's definitely benefits to that. Obviously, we need to be very picky with the businesses we choose to partner with, as any business should. You got to be careful of the businesses you partner with, right? Something may sound very opportunistic, but and we've learned this from mistakes. So you can spend a lot of time down certain avenues that just don't reap the results you had hoped for. Everything sounds good at the inception of the idea, but naturally over time, things fade, right? 
Uh, Interest fades. It's, it's, it's like going on a date and, and your first date is the most exciting it's ever going to be. If that's oh, not yeah. ticking the boxes for you even then, you've got a question. What's it going to be like in three months, six months time? So definitely. Yeah, it's 100%. Paul, we talked about it before we went on air, deploying patience, specifically with a podcast, right? I've done 204 episodes now of my podcast. And it's, it's it, at first, yeah, it was tough getting off the ground. We weren't getting a lot of listens, weren't getting a lot of downloads. We personally had a lot of hype around it because we were devoting a lot of time and energy a, a, into it. And we thought it was going to be the best thing ever. And naturally that's not what happened. But through the whole lifespan of having that podcast, a, a lot of things came to fruition, such as relationships with the podcast guests, such as learning from people that's, that charge five figures for courses and I'm getting it for free on my podcast episode and my audience gets the benefit as well. Plus think of all the content that comes from creating that podcast. Every single video is an ad on meta and we're collecting people that are watching 50% of those podcast videos and then retargeting them with ads for our agency. So there's all these intangibles that you don't see right away in terms of the ROI from that podcast, but they come in other means. There's been so many conversations I've had with people that have become clients of my agency, and I only find out months after they become a client that they've been listening to our podcast, they've been reading our blog, following our emails. So they already knew me before I knew them. That's why it was such an easy sale to have. So there's all these intangibles that come along with it, aside from just the downloads. I preach so much. I feel like we've missed each other somewhere. We should have met before now, Jason, because... So much of what you're saying is what I preach through LinkedIn and in my own sort of YouTube channel and podcasts and things. But it is, it can be disheartening when you, people don't realize there's a lot of hype around building a podcast because there's a lot of good things to come from it. But when you launch a podcast, and I've got a few clients right now are going through this pain. If you're watching, we had Irina on last week's episode and she's just about to launch hers. She's gone through the same thing. She can't afford to outsource a lot of the production for it. She's realized how much work's involved in it and that just keeps growing and keeps growing. So you've either got to find ways to use technology to your advantage. You've got to find ways to automate some things. You've got to find efficient workflows. And ultimately, you've got to pony up and just the book stops with you. If it's your podcast, you've got to get it done. But it's really nice for me to hear from somebody who's 204 episodes deep that still feels worth it your end of things that, that kind of gives a lot of hope for a lot of people if you were to i was just going to say sorry paul i was just going to say like with doing 204 episodes it becomes almost like it's a routine now what do they say in the seventh habits of highly effective people a habit is created after uh 67 days or 67 weeks or whatever it is right i, I believe sorry it's the one thing i believe it's the book that talks about the 67 the rule 67 and and i found that the, the podcast is just it's a weekly routine now. I, I block out my Wednesday afternoons to dedicate specifically to podcast content, churning out the content, conversing with my audio editor. All that is in that dedicated time slot that happens every single week and it's blocked out my calendar. Makes it easy. Yeah, I think the fact that a lot of the outcomes are intangible makes it really hard for a lot of people to get their head around because everybody, we're, we live in an age where Everybody wants short-term results. They want results now. They want the dopamine hit now. Pipeline is starting to go downwards and they're worried about revenue and how am I going to pay the bills at the end of the month? And if I do this podcast, man, I could be doing something else that might generate me some instant cash right now. And, and so they go away and try and do other things, but eventually they keep coming back to the things that are the long-term. The best time to plant an orchard was 20 years ago, guys. The second best time is right now. But you've got to have that vision. You've got to be able to take that step back and just not wait for the dopamine to come today. It's going to come in six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months even. It's a long game to play the podcast game. But exactly as you've said, just I've met some fantastic people who are now very good friends through podcasting and live streams on LinkedIn. Our class is similar if you're doing a serialized version. I guess if you were going to go back and, and relaunch your podcast as a startup business now, what is the... What's the learning you took from 204 episodes that you wish you thought of at the beginning? Yeah, good, great question. Um, and, you know, before I get into that, Paul, you know, I, the comment I just want to make is the fact that people are impatient or they don't see the immediate ROI makes total sense. This is why, what, 90% of businesses fail, 
a crazy statistic is because people just don't have the patience to, to push through the hard times. And that's like a podcast is essentially a little business within your business, right? It really is. You got to look at it like that, right? Not necessarily as it can be a compliment, but not the driver of your business necessarily. Majority of podcasts are not going to be the driver for your business, right? It's understanding that and almost having it as a business within the business and deploying patience on that like you would any sort of investment or endeavor, right? But if to answer your question, Paul, if I were to, it's funny because at episode 200, I actually rebranded my podcast and it's no longer called the Merged Marketing Podcast. It's called Drop the Mic which was also the title of the book I released in 2022. And with the change in direction was the change in format. I realized that through the podcast episodes, I was a lot of guests were attracted to me and used my podcast as an outlet to promote their own frameworks, to promote their own businesses. So it almost became like a 25 minute sales pitch for that guest, which is great for the conversation I might be having or for their business benefit and for the content, but not so great for the listener base, right? Listener base does not want to listen to a 25 minute sales pitch, right? So at episode 200, I, I flipped the script and I said, Hey, I'm more interested in the actual stories of how marketers came to success. I've had the pleasure of speaking on stages around the globe. I MC conferences in Europe. And so through those experiences, I was able to rub shoulders with a lot of prominent speakers in the marketing space. So through that, I used that outlet as an opportunity to have these guests on my podcast to talk about their experiences. And so instead of being more reactive to the PR agencies requesting guests to be on my show, I'm more doing outreach to the people that I really want to have on my podcast. And I think that's the big difference now is having genuine conversations with people and as opposed to having a guest that's just interested in the sales pitch, to be totally honest and transparent. And I think that's where you get the, the best engagement from the audience as well, is that everybody loves a story. Everybody loves bad guys and good guys and the challenges along the way. And it's, but it's really hard to shift that on the fly sometimes. I guess if you're a small business owner, you've got a, a million other things to think about. Not everybody's a great podcast host, certainly from day one. And I think my, the thing I'll throw into that is treat it as a learning process. Your, your first podcasts are going to be average at best, and you will learn tips and tricks, and you'll speak to people who run their own podcast, and you'll learn things from them. But the important thing is eventually you will be able to identify how to go about it easily you'll become much more confident at speaking and, and, and extracting the stories, I think, as well. Fair? Yeah, 100%. The way, and look, we have the likes of AI and ChatGPT and your own actual customized GPTs. They have tons of them. Just type in podcasts and explore GPTs, and you'll see all the podcast GPTs that are out there to help you create a format for your podcast, help you create a, you know, a script or questions to ask for your podcast. I will preface that by saying, if you're going to ask GPT to give you a list of questions to ask a podcast guest, make sure you prompt it by saying, give me unique questions that podcast guest has never been asked before, right? Because that's one thing you don't want to have is the same question asked to the same podcast guest time and time again. It just, you can tell it's been scripted or that you can tell it's been said a million times before. And this is what creates really good conversations. For me, when I do my podcast, I have a list of questions sitting there, ready to go. In case I have a podcast guest that is not that conversational, it's like pulling teeth, I might need to resort to that. But nine times out of 10, it's going to be a conversation like I'm sitting at a bar with, a, with, with somebody I just met and just going off of that conversation, going off of the responses that they're saying and building questions off of that. I think this is the type of podcast most people want to listen to, that Joe Rogan-esque type of podcast episode, right? Yeah. I think it's, it's also a little bit about not being afraid to be polarizing to an extent you've got everybody's got their own opinions and we we live in this world where lots of us who are, who are doing these who are building their own businesses who are small business entrepreneurs you've come from that corporate background where you weren't allowed to have a freaking opinion newsflash it's your business now you can have an opinion mm -hmm. and you're not going to scare away all your customers because what you're going to do is there's been polarizing and there's been polarizing on purpose People can tell the difference. It's, as long as it's genuine and authentic, then you can get away with it. But all you're going to do is pull the right people towards you and push the people away who aren't a good fit. So, and that's for me, is the beauty of a podcast is I can now share my opinions. I didn't dare have 10 years ago. That's not 
can that be true? Is that realistic? And I think that's probably something that you've called to as well, right? Yeah, definitely. I, I love the fact that you bring up push and pull, right? Because push and pull is important. You're going to attract a certain type of fish and you're going to retract a certain type of fish, right? You're going to push those away. And this is mirrored, it's parallel with the way we run advertising, the way we run ads on, on Meta. It's like we're constantly creating ads to push and pull people away. We don't want to people, we don't want people to opt into a lead magnet if they're not inevitably going to be a client of our clients, you know what I mean? Or for ourselves. And same with the podcast episode. This entire podcast episode is essentially a lead magnet to attract a certain person to you, somebody that knows, likes, and trusts you and wants to work with you. And it's a great, I guess you can call it a great lure for that objective. So question then, you released the, the, the book that we discussed in 2022, Drop the Mic Marketing. What kind of draw of you what did you get up one morning just think gee like i really need to write a book <laughs> like where, where did it come from yeah so this is so this book is really before the use of chat gpd so it was it actually was written and i'm not a writer but i have a, a guy by the name of mike almer in my network he's written for some of the big newspapers here in canada and we started a relationship and then he said hey i, I want to write your book so we ended up doing a barter deal where we ended up doing advertising for him and, and he wrote my book for me. And, and it was such a great experience working with Mike. He uh, sat me down uh, in my office here. We had about four different two hour conversations. He recorded all of our conversations and he would ask me everything from where I grew up, the trials and tribulations of growing up to starting the business about my parents, everything in between. And he got all of this content and then he went back to his drawing board and then he came up with the entire idea for the book. He came up with the, he ghost wrote the book and, and he did a fantastic job. I had no idea where that book was going. And he came back to me and said, here's your book, drop the mic from failed rock star to digital marketing rock star. And that was the whole idea behind it. So it talked about my whole growing up, having the band, having music, being a passion. And he intertwines this whole element of like rock music throughout the book, which I thought was just fantastic. But if I were to just sit here and drum up a book by myself, heck man, forget about it. I couldn't do it. Maybe with chat GPT, but I couldn't do it on my own. That's for sure. It's, uh, but sometimes I find that those business relationships are serendipity, right? Like you, it's not quite blind luck because you make your own path, you forge your own path and you surround yourself in your network of the people who will undoubtedly influence that journey at some point. And it's amazing to hear how that journey went for you. I guess you'd never have seen that coming. You'd never have prompted yourself to write a book. It just came and. I guess what's the, because you're the second guest we've had on the show that's released their own book or two. What's the impact been since you've written that book? Has it improved, improved debt metrics in the business or is it just it's a personal tick box? Or? There, there are several ways you can use a book. We've worked with clients that have leveraged books as lead magnets, right? As, as the, the top of funnel marketing approach for their business. For me though, it was really, it wasn't that at all. It's more of a legacy piece. It's something I always have there. I give to friends and family, I give to clients. When I went to, when I speak at events, I'll bring some books with me. I'll do some Q&A at the end of my session and anybody that answers a question correctly gets a book. So it, it's things like that. That's how I'm using the book. I, if it makes sales, fantastic, but it's really not the focal point of having the book. It's really, it, it's a way to complement all the other efforts I'm making and helps me become more known and trusted in my niche. If people read the book, they obviously get to know me and then inevitably, hopefully they become a client of mine one day. That's an amazing story to hear. And it refreshing to hear a book written that, that doesn't have a business angle behind it, which is I'm a, I'm a bookaholic. I've loved, you can't, you can see some of the books off the side of all the classics. I've got Stephen King, I've got, I'm a nerd. So I've got Stephen King, I've got Star Wars, we've got Lord of the Rings, we've got, and then I've got all the biographies of different people are usually quite polarizing people but i love literature and and my whole stuff brought my sons up to love literature as well and i just think in this day and age of digital everything digital first everything there is nothing still that quite competes with holding in your hands a work of art from somebody else because that's what they are it's it's a work of passion it's a work of art and the every book tells a story and it's not always the story that is written in the book which is, again, like it, you can take it to a lot of levels. Just the fact that you can use if it, it to help people share your story, that's beautiful. 
And it's interesting, as I pull up the book, because Mike Almer wrote his own book here called Show and Tell Writing, and he talks about a great short business book about how to write a short, great business book. And this specific book here, he talks about that. If you think you know the title of your book, then you've done it wrong. You actually don't know the title of your book until it's over, right? You don't start with the title and then write the book. You write the book and then come up with the title, right? It's like writing a LinkedIn post. You should never have your hook line first. Write the damn post, tell people what you want to tell them, then write the hook line because then only then can you tell what's going to be worth their time, what's going to catch their attention from what you thought was going to come out. The amount of times I write a post that goes nowhere, I'll, I'll go, oh, I must write a post about that. And then I start writing it and I go off a complete different tangent and end up writing something about something totally different. My God, I didn't see that coming in the slightest. I think it's just kind of repetition and practice for a lot of people. But absolutely, if you've got something of value to share, make sure that you worry more about getting it off your chest than putting a name on it. 100%. For a lot of marketing. Yeah, definitely. 100%. Yeah, it's, I think that's a, a fantastic way to put it. It's just, and also, what's the purpose of having the book in the first place? That's a question you need to answer to. And I think, again, it's a recurring theme, much like starting a podcast. If the immediate thought is, I'm going to release this book because I have a great idea and I'm going to make lots of money from it, you're going to set yourself up for failure, a lunch bag, a lunch bag letdown. You know what I mean? It's not going to work out that way. Launching it's a great compliment. You're right. A hundred percent. It's a complimentary piece to everything that everything else that you're doing. If, if look, I can understand the frustration. If you dedicate a lot of time to your podcast, like if you're working on it five days a week to try to get it off the ground and your business is suffering because of it. Yeah, sure. I can understand that frustration, but if you just time it correctly, set chunks in your calendar of when you're going to work on it and just chip away at it. Um, you're going to be you're just going to, you're going to set yourself up for success that way. And we talked earlier on Paul about how majority of podcasts don't get past the 10th episode. It, it makes sense. I'm sure people batch 10 episodes in one sitting and it's okay, let's just test this out and see if it works. So you launch 10 episodes, it doesn't get the traction they had expected, so it, it falls on deaf ears and flat feet and they just they they forget about it. That, that's the wrong way to do it. I every single week continue to go. Give yourself a realistic timeline in order to really see the results. And I would say, give yourself, at first, for me, it was a hundred episodes. I'm like, I'm going to get to 100 episodes. Yeah. Then we got the 100. It's okay, cool. We've gotten some business from this. This is awesome. We had these great relationships, great people we met and let's do a hundred more. And we did a hundred more. So every hundred is like that kind of checkpoint where it's, do we want to do a hundred more? I think that's the, the nice kind of caveat that I can share with the audience from this is and I, I totally agree i so when i think back to when i first was working in SaaS sales in the contact center space i had no experience in the contact center space i had no background no network no no knowledge of marketing or sales and one of the first things we decided to do was launch a live stream every week on a thursday where i'd interview influencers and leaders from the industry and i got to pick their brains on amazing subjects and to this day, I still speak to so many of that amazing network that I built doing that. The, the champions that, that love the live streams, the people that appeared on them, the people I was introduced to as a result of it. It's a fast track way to create a network. In a purposeful, focused network, I think, is the important part. It's intentional because it has to be. Otherwise, why have you got those people on the show? And I think that's the bit that a lot of people miss is those hidden benefits can't write them on a sheet and go, oh, hey, we hit our KPIs this month for the podcast. It doesn't work that way ever. No, definitely not. Think about this, right? If anybody, any business owner out there that has a podcast that goes to conferences, right? And let's say there's a specific potential client you want to work with or do business with. Why not introduce yourself? Not as like the service-based business that you want to inevitably sell them, but just to open a relationship. And what better icebreaker than being like, hey, I think your story is very interesting. I'd love to hear more about it on my podcast. Oh, you have a podcast? Oh, fantastic. Let's do it. And at, every, at the end of every podcast episode, my guest will always ask me when we're off air, tell me about your business. I don't know much about you. What do you guys do? Oh, now that you ask, oh, well, let me tell you. Right? So it, it, it opens up that kind of conversation because it's like anything. You're leading with value, not the sale. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you couldn't agree. Coming to the end of the episode now, Jason, it's been a breath of fresh air having you on the show and we've only been running for, this is episode number five, I think. So already setting the benchmark for, for lots of other people to follow. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. 
is there anything you'd like to how can people reach you if they want to reach out and find a bit more about the, the Jap japanese rock star who turned social media marketer Sure. If you want to know about uh, my Japanese rock star endeavors, you can go pick up Drop the Mic Marketing on, that's on Amazon. But if you want to learn more about what I do and how I go about it, you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, J Hunt Official, J A Y H U N T O F I C I A L. And on there, you can uh, follow my content, listen to my podcast, Drop the Mic, and uh, catch up with me there. Perfect. We will definitely make sure that's in the show notes as we release the episode. Thanks very much for your time, Jason. Uh, I really appreciate your, your uh, inputs on the show. And uh, we'll see you next week for another episode of Market Pulse, Pros and Pioneers. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to feature on a future show, or you've got some ideas for folks who would make a great guest, please drop us a line. The contact details are in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Your host today was Paul Banks, founder at Javelin Content Management. Javelin specializes in helping busy business owners just like you to repurpose video content, taking all the stress and tech problems away, and turning your long-form video into literally hundreds of pieces of content without breaking the bank. If you want to launch your personal brand, become the vendor of choice for your audience, or maximize your sales revenue impact, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for the next episode, and don't forget to give us a subscribe and a review. Our podcast is only possible with your support.